The Citicorp Center, or 601 Lexington, as it is known today, had a major structural defect at the time of construction. Its story is both fascinating with many twists and turns, with an unlikely savior and a race against time to rectify the building before it collapses. It's also a tale of engineering ethics, as it was designed by a world-renowned engineer that had to realize his major mistake. Hi, I'm Brendan, your structural engineer. Let's get into it. The Citicorp Center at the time of construction was to be the seventh tallest building in the world, topping out at a height of 279 meters, and it required some of the best engineers in the world to come together under the lead of William LeMessurier. This building also had a striking feature at its base. You see, they'd planned it, they'd brought the land, but they didn't have rights over the whole block. There was a church, St. Paul's Lutheran Church, on the site as well. They allowed them to demolish it and rebuild a new church. However, they still required the church to sit on the corner, underneath one of the corners of this towering building. And they didn't allow any structure to pass through, either onto the building or through the structure. This required them to come up with a unique design solution. They did. Instead of having the columns in the corner, like a standard build, they moved them to the center of each base. So this is where we get the striking feature of the city called tower to a towering height of 35 meters and coming to a 22 meter cantilever essentially cantilevering up and over the building this is a unique feature of the citicorp tower and makes it quite iconic for its area this feature required some unique engineering solutions to solve it you see it had these massive cantilevers so what they came up with was essentially a diagrid system with reverse chevrons going up the building that allow the forces to strike back to that central column to bring the forces from the outer edges back to the central column on the frame. These external frames were also designed to help resist the wind loads. William was so impressed with the design of this tower and wanted the engineering expressed on the outer face, showing its unique diagrid system. During many debates and discussions, he lost out to the architect. He wanted his big glass tower. And this is what we see today. This external diagrid was not there only just for the gravity forces for transferring the loads from the outer columns. It was also there for the stability system. This is one of the unique features of the tower and also led to one of the design flaws. This design flaw was not found out till much later after this building was occupied and it came from an unlikely place. Due to the unique features in this building, it was one of the recommended buildings to review when you're doing a design course through university. And this building was assigned to an undergraduate engineer Diane Hartley. So she took the building and was reviewing it. And when she was reviewing it, she found something strange. When she looked at it right on, with the winds coming perpendicular to the tower, she was able to get the numbers to stack up. However, when she twisted that building 45 degrees and had these quartering winds, she was unable to get the design to stack up under the numbers that she was putting together. And having concerns about this, and obviously thinking that she had made a mistake, she contacted her lecturer and he advised her to contact the actual engineering firm to see how they solved this problem. And so Diane took the phone and called William LeMessurier and discussed with him her findings. And he was quite fascinated. You see, this is potentially where expertise will let you down. You see, these quartering rooms, when you twist a normal building, it's increasing your lever arm. So the building is actually stronger under these type of actions. However, due to the unique feature of having these columns central, this lever arm is much less. So retrieved by this, LeMessurier took action and actually started to do the numbers. You see, as Diane didn't have those preconceptions from designing many buildings, she looked at the building at the whole and checked every direction to make sure it was designed in the right aspects. She was able to find the fatal design flaw that the world-renowned engineer overlooked. And this is where he started to have a chilling thought. Because when he did the numbers, he realized these type of cording rings actually increase the stresses in the building in excess of 140%. So LeMessurier at this time, realizing these increased forces, did everything he could to try and reduce the loads and justify the structure. So what he was looking at is essentially there's a tune mass damper inside the building. What this does, counterbalances the building under the actions of wind loads and helps reduce the sway of the building, thus reducing the loads. However, this was still not enough. So then he took to additional wind tunnel testing in the University of Ontario. And when they did the boundary layer testing, they found that the tower was actually highly susceptible to these type of actions due to the dynamic properties of the building and actually increased the wind loads. And when he was looking back through his documents, he also realized it was another design change that made this area even more critical. You see, these whole welded frames at the time of designing the building were called up to be welded full strength 
welded connection. However, during erection, the steel fabricator was finding it hard to put the structure together as it was documented. So they actually requested a design change to allow them to have bolted splice connections, which were approved. So when he added up both these quartering rings and these bolted splice connections, he found they were undesigned and they were overstressed by 160%. This was extremely worrying, as this made it highly susceptible to any wind loads. It can actually fail as low as a 70 mile per hour wind. Now for New York, that is a really low wind and it's quite a common occurrence. So this discover filler measure was both surprising and chilling and facing potential bankruptcy, litigation and professional disgrace and the potential catastrophic collapse of this building. There was only one path and this was for him to take action. If you are enjoying this content, please smash that like button. It helps me out and lets me know what type of videos to make for you. And let's keep going. La Measure then came with a plan and set up a series of meetings with both the architect, his insurance company, the board that owned the City Corp Center and the Board of Engineers for New York. And they had confidential meetings about the problem and he explained to them what the issue was and the fact that it needed to be addressed. He also came there with a solution. Now that solution was to weld these bolted connections together. Now, this is where they hit a potential crossroads, as should they notify the public or not? And at the time, it was decided to not notify the public, and as may unduly distress and panic the residents in the local area, and they only released a vague press release that the building was going to get maintenance and repair works over a series of months. As the work was starting to commence, this story nearly leaked to the public. So an architect actually contacted the measure's office realizing something was up with the city court center. And when LeMessure went back to contact that same journalist, he was not there. You see, they had all went on strike for better paying conditions at all the news agencies where they sort of got some of their luck as the story essentially evaporated and it was never followed on beyond this point. And now this is where the planning phases was beginning as well. The team had an understanding how susceptible this tower was to wind loads. They set up an evacuation plan and wind and storm monitoring processes and what would trigger a potential evacuation. And the area that was required to evacuate around the building required the evacuation of over 200,000 people. This would need quite extensive planning for additional shelter, food and relocation over a period of time that the storm may hit. This was put together with the mayor and the Red Cross, a potential action plan that may need to be activated in the event of a certain storm heading towards New York. And we'll also bring up that tune mass dampener that we bought at the start of the building. It was actually one of the first tune mass dampeners to be installed on any tower in the world. And you see, there's actually two types of tune mass dampeners. You either have an active tune mass dampener that requires electricity through activation and pulleys to be able to tune the wind loads out. It gives you a lot broader range that the tune mass dampener can be activated in. So essentially making it more effective at tuning out a wider range. However, it does require a constant electricity grid. Whereas you have another one, which is a passive tune mass dampener, which is essentially like a giant pendulum or water. There's different types of these that can do this type of work. However, they are more limited as they'll essentially be constructed for a certain wind or vibration range. However, they do not require the electricity. Fortunately for La Meja, well, there's also a curse as well. The one at the City Corp Tower was an active one, so it required that full-time constant electricity. To ensure that this tune mass dampener would always have electricity whenever it needed it, they set up a series of backup generators to ensure that it was a power during an event which would potentially knock out the electricity grid. This ensured them that they have constant electricity over period of time and make sure that tune mass dampener was in its active state whenever it was needed. They also contacted the manufacturer of the tune mass dampener to ensure that it was in peak optical condition at any time that it needed to be activated. So this is where the repair work started under the command of Le Measure. Well, Le Measure was constantly doing numbers, graphs and figures of all the consequences that could potentially happen and directing which connection to strengthen next. So the building progressively got stronger over time and required a bigger wind that would activate that evacuation process. The work was so extensive for them to complete it in a reasonable time. They had to hire pretty much every welder within a hundred mile radius of New York. And they even sped up the certification process through the New York Board for Construction, where they got more people certified in a quicker time to ensure the workforce was extensive enough to allow for the quick rectification of this structure. 
and under the command of Lameja, it was almost to military precision. As they wanted to keep it somewhat quiet, the only time it was able to be done was the secrecy of night. However, it did continue on seven days a week. See, the carpenters would start work at 5 p.m. where they would come in after the office workers had left, where they would expose the critical joints the measure had noted and set up protective screens. And then at 8 p.m., the welding would start. And this is where the strengthening works in the towers began. And this would continue on until 4 a.m., at which point they would stop. Then a series of laborers would come in and clean up the area. So when the office workers started back in the morning, they were none wiser to the extent of work that had been done. A couple of weeks in, to starting the repair work, a hurricane formed off the coast of New York and it was actually heat tracking to actually strike New York. And this is where everyone started sweating blood, as Le Measure recalls, as they started to fear that they'd need to activate that evacuation plan and preliminary plans were actually set into motion. However, just before they needed to activate it, storm veered off and went back out to sea. So they never had to initiate the evacuation plan. After a number of months of work on the tower, the building was fully strengthened and a minor litigation therefore ensued. LeMessure came to the Citicorp group and offered them full extent of his insurance, which was $2 million. As rumor has it, this didn't even cover the full extent of the repair works that needed to be undertaken. And the public didn't actually become aware of this fatal flaw until 20 years after his actual event. LeMessure was both praised and criticized for his actions, as he didn't take the due diligence that he needed to do to ensure that all the critical wind cases were checked, especially on a state-of-the-art building that required a unique design solution overlooking the potential obvious solution that was found by this graduate engineer. He was also not aware of the design changes that happened during construction and the potential impact it had on its design as well. And also being such a state of that building as well, he was just reliant on the code, which potentially didn't cover all the aspects that he needed to on such a unique build. His public statements both got criticized heavily as well, as he essentially kept the public undercover, they didn't actually know the true extent of the damage that it could occur to the building. They couldn't assess for themselves whether they wanted to be in the area or not. And also by keeping it from the engineering fraternity, it potentially allowed for future buildings to miss this obvious mistake. Being a world-renowned engineer, this was something that his team should have been able to pick up. And if they missed it, it's likely that other engineers would as well. So by not letting other people know much sooner, it potentially could have led to other buildings having this fatal design flaw as well. But LeMessure should also be praised for his act. You see, he took action when he found the problem instead of just closing his eyes. He notified the people with no regard to what that meant for himself. And when an undergraduate engineer came to him with a problem that she thought was wrong with the tower, he listened to Diane, took her concern seriously, and realized that he had made a fatal mistake. See, in the end, I feel this is really a tale of engineering ethics in its finest. Yes, he did make some mistakes and no one is perfect and we should really never shoot the messenger. The fact that he actually took action and fixed it should be praised. What do you think? Do you think LeMessure's action should have been any different? If you do, please comment below. And if you did enjoy this video, hit that like button. And if you haven't subscribed at this point and like more videos about structural engineering, hit the subscribe button. And to get all updates, you need to ding the bell. And I hope to see you next week. Bye.